one of the trends, as we talk about 2021 20, trends for uh, startup ventures, one of the trends is the decentralization that's going on of entrepreneurship and innovation that, you know, it used to be, you had to be in Silicon Valley to have a tech startup, um, you know, and a few generations ago, you had to be in New York and, um, you know, during the Renaissance, you had to be in Florence. <laughs> So the point is that through, you know, through most of history, there's kind of been a cluster of entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, generally coupled with a cluster of capital, right? Uh, and I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing right now is that there's been a decoupling of clusters of innovation and clusters of capital. And there's been a decentralization of entrepreneurship and innovation that we're seeing. It's not just Silicon Valley today, right? It's it's Atlanta, it's Austin, it's Tel Aviv, it's Florianopolis, Brazil, it's Berlin. Uh, there are these clusters of innovation, clusters of entrepreneurship all over the world today. So I honestly think that, um, you know, when you look at, um, at 2021, I think it's the best time ever in history to be an entrepreneur or an innovator. Um, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur right now. There are more sources of capital than ever before. Uh, global, access to global markets is easier than ever before. The means of production are available to all, right? You don't have to go buy a million dollars worth of servers anymore. It's, you know, it's three clicks on AWS and you suddenly have an entire server farm up and running. Um, and that just wasn't true in previous generations. Um, as I said, I think perhaps most profoundly of all is this, um, the fact that there's multiple clusters going on, there's also multiple waves of, of opportunity going on right now that throughout my career um, in Silicon Valley, there usually was one wave at a time. There was, there was the semiconductor wave, right? And then there was all kinds of opportunity for startups around semiconductors. And then there was the personal computer wave and all kinds of opportunity around personal computers. And then there was the internet wave and then, and then the mobile social wave. And each one of those waves lasted, you know, 10 to 15 years. And then we were on to the next one. But what makes today, I think, unique is that there's multiple waves of opportunity going on right now. Um, you know, AI and machine learning, right? That's a whole wave of opportunity of its own. Um, there's uh, uh, personal transportation, autonomous cars, um, self-driving trucks. Um, you know, that, that's a whole thing of its own. Uh, medical technology, bioengineering, gene editing, also a huge wave of its own with tons of opportunity around it, uh, direct to consumer brands, uh, new models of content publishing. There's just an awful lot going on right now, um, which I think is super exciting. And as I said, I think that makes it different than previous times in my career. So innovations always happen at the intersection of what customers want, what investors are interested in putting capital into um, and what is technologically feasible, right? That, that, that's where innovation happens, but innovation also happens within the regulatory environment. Um, and so we're super lucky to have with us this morning, um, two people who I think are exactly the right people to talk to about this. Um, Danielle, as she mentioned, um, spent several years running a, a very successful startup accelerator program um, and, and now is on the, on the investing side, sees a lot of deals. Um, and Louis has been a Silicon Valley lawyer for his whole career and um, sees a lot of deals, uh, both from the entrepreneur side and from the venture side. He represents venture capital firms in his practice as well as representing entrepreneurs. So um, we have exactly the right two people here to talk about this. Um, so Danielle, can you kind of at a high level, just give us a sense of what you see right now in terms of deal flow and in terms of what, you know, what's interesting? Yeah, I mean, you brought up a lot of great Great points. Um, I, I would say that for the first time, we are really leveling the playing field for founders globally. Um, I've heard more and more funds in not only investing in spaces that they might not have otherwise invested in. Um, you know, healthcare is definitely one of those where a lot of VCs have now found this new interest in because of the pandemic. And everyone is very, you know, wants to make sure that they're safe. Um, but not only that, they're, they're funding companies outside of the US or even outside of Silicon Valley. Um, it used to be you know, that VCs wanted to fund companies that they could easily go to board meetings to or talk to their customers in. 
But given this new wave of virtual, um, and I don't see that going away, um, we're seeing you know, VCs investing in, in markets um, outside of here uh, because they can be everywhere all at the same time. Um, so I, I would definitely say that that's, that's a huge trend um, going on right now. Um, and, and that should open the doors for a lot of entrepreneurs. But, you know, what I'm also seeing, it, and especially being on the seed investor side, um, and you can all see this, you know, from, from the reports that are coming out, all of these mega rounds um, are kind of eating up uh, the funding, um, and, and there's not as much funding going to the earlier stage companies. So, uh, which makes the, the you know, it's super, com really, really competitive, especially when there's less dollars to go around. And it means that I don't think it's going to be as easy, and maybe this isn't true for you know, some of the top tier funds, but for most of the funds, they are gonna wanna see that traction. They, are, they wanna see you know, that you do have some legs before giving you, you know, a couple million dollars, or you're gonna have to find other means of capital. So I do think that founders in the early stages are gonna have to get a little more creative. Um, and you know, uh, Louie and I were talking beforehand and he'll, he'll hop in, you know, on, on how that's playing out on the legal side. Um, but, uh, you know, it's definitely something to, to take into consideration um, now. And then on the trend side, I briefly mentioned this, but we did see a definite uptick in the amount of healthcare deals uh, that were going on. Our fund uh, does focus on healthcare. So that's one of the areas that I spend a lot of time in. Um, but, you know, I'm, I do think it also opens the doors for um, new ways of work, right? How do, we, how do we not only work remotely, but how do we make sure we're, we're working in a secure way, right? No organization was really set up for the pandemic. Um, they were all kind of holding off the conversation, like everyone had to be working in the office. And now all of a sudden it wasn't a question, it just happened, but um, they weren't set up. So now these issues of ergonomics or VPNs or, you know, making sure, you know, these phishing um, attacks, you know, ransomware, things like that, all of these things that they might have had protected in house. Now they have to understand what that means outside of the office. And then, you know, the question of is office space really necessary, I think is going to be really interesting um, coming in. So yes, definitely seeing a lot of, um, a lot of an interesting movement. Um, 2020 has changed us all it, you know, good and bad. Um, but I think a lot of things that have changed are here to stay. Thank you. I think the whole, fu I think the whole future of work thing is, uh, is a really interesting uh, topic. And the current issue of the New Yorker has a, has a super good article about uh, future of work. So I recommend that. So uh, Danielle, it's great. So um, Louie, how about you in terms of, you know, when you look at the deals that are uh, going across your desk these days, what's what's different about them heading into 2021 than perhaps they were in 2019? Um, let me start off. I am the happiest lawyer. Many lawyers I meet are not happy people. I love what I do. Um, I get emails and intros from people like Brett and Danielle who say, you know, meet these founders, they need counsel. And I get to tell them about my favorite topic, entrepreneurship and how to set up their company. And I get to talk to them right at the beginning. Um, and never have I seen such an onslaught of new startups as since mm -hmm. the pandemic began. You know, like everybody, I was, I was just looking at my, uh, my numbers with my accountant and, you know, March and April were horrible. <laughs> ah, right. I remember March. I remember March and April. None yeah, of us I, knew whether, none of us knew whether the sky was falling or not. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and it was like a tale of two years, right? We had, we had, you know, the first half of the year, which was pretty much dead. And then the second half of the year was an explosion of activity where we all learned how to do deals based, based on meeting people on zoom. And um, I, I closed a hundred million dollar acquisition where nobody ever met. Like, and, and it was cross border, like never seen this before. Incredible. Um, so um, that's obviously awesome. Okay, the types of um, deals that we're seeing, I wanted to spend a word about that. So um, it used to be, you know, 10 years ago that a series A was, you know, $5 million to go figure out whether there was a company here. Well, geez, that's now like called that's a whole different category called friends and family round. And, and then there's the MVP round. And then there is the 
pre-seed round, and then there is the seed A, seed B, before we get to finally the series A. And as I was saying to Danielle earlier, you know, for, for the start, for a lot of the startups that I've been nurturing along for five or six years, you know, they haven't had a series A, they've been very successful at raising just enough lean capital to get through the next, you know, big uh, uh, milestone, but they, they never raised a, a proper round. So they never got the, the simple, well, $5 million for 20% of my company. No, they, they took $1 million and gave away a third of their company like three times. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get to a series A finally, um, uh, and you find out that the convertible note holders had a $2 million cap and then you have this other safe guy who who had a, a $5 million cap. And when you put it all together in the in the cap table, you have some people that you did not expect in control. Mm -hmm. And your founder folks, uh, core folks, are not left with enough gas in the tank to get through the race. And so I'm having a lot of conversations with investors and entrepreneurs and everybody around the table saying, hey, like we have to revisit the whole thing here. Um, and, and sure, the new money is going to do their 20%, you know, for 5 million or whatever it is that that part hasn't changed so much. It's, it's all of these conversations, Brett and Danielle, that we're having to have to kind of reset yep. uh, things. Um, another trend I've seen is founder divorce. And I, and I produced a couple of webinars uh, on this topic where founders, um, you know, they get you, you just like everybody in, in life, you know, you, 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 you traverse this, this crisis that we've had, uh, where you're suddenly in a, in a one bedroom apartment in San Francisco, and you're not going out, your only connectivity with the world is a zoom and, you know, things don't happen at the pace and, and things aren't happening like you want. And then, and, and money's tight or, or whatever. And, and so people are breaking up and breaking up is hard to do. Um, and so um, I guess my advice is when you start a company, please go see a, a lawyer that works with startups and gets it and sets it up properly mm -hmm. so that you know, it's possible to have an orderly uh, situation, you know, a clean cap table. And uh, it, you know, if you need to bring in people or move them out, you can do it. Um, okay, types of companies that we're seeing, this, this whole remote uh, collaboration thing is mm -hmm. so, I have this, this client called Flow Immersive. I'm not supposed to be plugging companies, but this is so cool. And it, it um, you, whether you have the uh, augmented reality glasses or not, you can go into a virtual um, room with someone and you can manipulate data. The data appears as between you and you can move things around. It's the coolest thing. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of really interesting uh, remote collaboration uh, uh, software. You know, it's B2B. It's, everything's B2B enterprise software still. Uh, uh, consumer's tough, um, but B2B uh, enterprise software is, is like the magic uh, thing you have to say. What are my MRRs, my ARRs, uh, Brett? And uh, it, those, uh, you know, metrics are getting tougher and tougher to get a, a Series A. Of course, you can still get a seed, pre seed, seed A, seed B. Uh, a note or whatever. Um, but those are my observations just to kick it off, Brett. And that um, there are a lot of people that are picking up on the fact that you like fish tacos. <laughs> well, I think that is a trend. Exactly. <laughs> Louie and I are looking forward to the day when we can actually dine indoors again. But we, uh, <laughs> but we, do, but we do occasionally meet on the sidewalk in Palo Alto to have fish tacos. <laughs> so, um, so, Louis, if I know it is a question in chat that I think is a, it actually kind of dovetails into the trend thing in the sense that um, so uh, H1B visas. So, um, you know, Silicon Valley is very much a place that has been driven by um, uh, by immigrants who have come here and built great companies. Uh, and of course, during the Trump era, um, uh, a lot of a lot, lot of visa quotas got uh, got limited, and now presumably in the Biden administration, some of those visa quotas may get lifted. So Vinod asks the question that I've heard a lot, which is, um, how do you start a country? Sorry, how do you start a company here when you're on an H-1B? Because it's there's some complications with that. Is that something you run across, Louis? Uh oh, I do. It's full of. Uh oh, am I unfrozen? Okay, um, Silicon yeah, Valley is full of folks that come. 
from our world and all have immigration issues. I'm working and I'm an LP in a new fund called One Way Ventures. It's a venture fund whose mission to fund immigrant founders. It's awesome. Um, I, I don't know how that limits anything because you know most of us come from somewhere else. Brett, you and I are like unicorns in Silicon Valley being <laughs> right, here. right, because we're actually local, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, awesome. But yes, it, it's very easy to form a Delaware C Corp uh, in a day uh, or or any other kind of corporate entity, and then use that to uh, uh, file a, an H one B visa. However, you know the timing and the cost involved, and you know you've got to establish. Um, you, you know your your ability to uh, pay the the salary, and so it's it's uh, it's not usually the best vehicle to get an H one B. Brett, great. So, Danielle, another question I've been dying to ask you, uh, and you and I actually had a had a little conversation on the phone about this a couple weeks ago. But um, so there's been a lot of attention paid recently to the fact that something like only 3% of venture capital goes to women-led ventures, um, and even less goes to you know black and brown entrepreneurs. Um, and so there's been a lot of discussion about this in the last year or two about, um, you know, about what, why is there no, not more diversity with regard to uh, companies that venture capitalists invest in. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, sort of now that you're sitting on on that side of the table, on the investment side of the table, how do you how do you see that? Do you see good diversity in terms of the deal flow that you're looking at today? I mean, I am, um, but I, you know, given that I look like the people that are struggling to find people that look like them, um, you know, it might it might help um, <laughs> at least. Um, it'd be interesting to hear, you know, a, a male VC's perspective in in that regard. Um, I do think that over the years, top of the funnel has been the biggest issue for, for VCs. Um, there just hasn't been enough women-led companies. And then, you know, then again, we get into the issue of once they do get in front of a VC, um, VCs have tended to fund companies that look like them, right? It's things they understand, sure. right? And so now we are having this conversation around diversity and bringing this as, as, as an awareness. I don't think that VC, not all VCs anyways, I don't think they were consciously saying like, you know, you're a woman, no. Um, but I do, you know, because that that conscious bias has been brought out, um, I think they are being more aware of it. I do think that people are um, making sure that their funnel and their pipeline looks a little more diverse. Um, I do see um, groups like uh, Gangels, um, you know, bringing bringing this issue to light and making sure they are funding companies that are women-led or LGBTQ or want to have diverse teams, right? Like, and there is science out there that says that having a diverse team leads to better outcomes. So now that we have that, of course, VCs are looking for the best outcome. So it, you know, it, it benefits them to, to fund these things um, or fund these types of companies, I should say. And so um, I do think we've, We've come, actually, you know, within the last couple of years, I think we have come a long way. I do want to give us some credit. We do have a lot of work, you know, to a lot of work to go, but um, mm -hmm. I do think, you know, it's it's getting a little better out there. I mean, even within Alchemist, where I was seen, seeing even more companies, you know, people used to say, oh, you know, there's, there's not enough women in the room. And it's like, well, we're building B2B companies here. Like, there just weren't a lot. But then as we were you know, as the years were going over the last, you know, two to three years, I would say there were definitely more and more women in the room. And of course we expanded, not expanded, but um, we had a stronger global presence um, and that's bringing even more women. So I, um, I do think that certain industries do um, have more women led companies or more diverse companies. I will say probably healthcare, HR tech, even, even companies that are deep tech, or very science-based, you know, women in the science realm, although it's been hard, I have seen a lot more women leaders, you know, in, in those areas. And so building these kind of deeper tech companies, um, you know, I've seen a lot more women-led companies there too. So um, I do think it's, it'll, there'll be more and more uh, like that. Uh, but, you know, if we're looking in traditional like B2B SaaS, like security, you know, um, even, uh, uh, 
even even hardware companies too, like EVs, like there's there's just I haven't seen a lot, um, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of women led companies mm-hmm. there. So it just depends. So I think Daniel makes a really great point, which is that uh, so all an investor really cares about is return on investment, right? That's that's, that's what we should job. care about. That's what we should that's, care about. <laughs> well, and that's you know that. You know, VCs for the most part they're investing money out of a fund, mm-hmm. and the limited partners who put money into the fund mm-hmm. uh, have given the general partner one fiduciary responsibility, which is maximize the return on my investment. Yeah. So, so really, all an investor should care about is return on investment. Yeah, it shouldn't what, matter what they what, look like. <laughs> right, but but Daniel made a really good point a couple minutes ago, which is that. Conventional wisdom today has become the fact that diverse teams tend to be high performing teams, that diverse teams tend to outperform homogenous teams. And so the fact that that's kind of become, um, you know, a well accepted uh, fact backed up by research should actually be the primary thing that starts to starts to move this, uh, which I think is really a great point. So. Um, uh, a couple of great questions coming in in chat. So Marie asks about where the other innovation hotspots in the world today are. Um, and you know, I think I mentioned earlier a few of them. So obviously in the US, uh, Austin is very much a uh, uh, innovation hotspot these days. Uh, the general Seattle area, partly because of the number of people who've come out of Amazon and come out of Seattle um, and created startups. Uh, New York, hey, obviously Brad, for- I've got a slide yeah. on that. You want me to, if I can share the screen? Sure. Okay. Do you have, do you have sharing permission? You should have sharing permission. Um, and then around, yep, see it, yep. Go for it, Louis. Yeah, so um, what I thought was interesting is that the number of dollars are still heavily concentrated in the typical places, Silicon Valley, Boston, in New York. But I think a lot of the, the these companies that are in Silicon Valley, the people are actually in other places, Brett. Um, at, at least, uh, you know, post pandemic. Uh, but but I, I think it's interesting that every year we say that that uh, money is going other places and every year we still see this huge concentration in, you know, the main hubs. Um, I'm seeing a lot more in the Utah area and in the Southeast. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, go ahead. Super, super interesting. Um, and then uh, Robin jumps in. Robin's with uh, Rafina Capital, and uh, uh, and mentions that uh, London, Netherlands, and Germany. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, Berlin. I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in Berlin in the last couple of years, and I got to say that Berlin is a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty happening spot for innovation and entrepreneurship these days. Yeah, I mean, uh, Brett, Brett, you and I met at a at a global kind of accelerator, right? Um, and the types of innovation we're, we were seeing globally. I think far outpaces, you know, kind of what we're in terms of true like new technology. I think the United States, like the companies that were born here, were feeling a little more um, stagnant in terms of innovation. Um, you know, at least at least from my perspective, I, I I'm I'm glad global companies are now kind of getting the awareness um, that they deserve because there's been a lot of great ideas, really strong tech. Um, coming from different places around the world. Hey, Danielle, I have a question for you. Do you find that either your fund or your LPs or the other investors that you talk to in your network, do you feel like their investment appetite, uh, just in terms of pure appetite for new deals, is the same or better or worse than before the pandemic? For new deals, I would say it's at least the same. Um, You know, we... (laughs) It's a sad truth, but we'll probably look at 500 companies to close like the two deals that we will for for the year, right? So we need to, we really need to make sure that our numbers at least stay the same. Um, And then every fund has their own kind of focus areas. Um, So unless like focus areas are getting bigger, like we're not going to be seeing any extra type of deal flow, um, if that makes sense. So I would say at the very least it's staying the same and we need it to stay the same in order to hit our numbers. Um, whether it's more or less, I think that de- that depends on how many people you have on your your you know partner team. Um, because how many more can they honestly take? And have you done an investment where you've never met the person? 
in, in um yeah actually so this was an interesting thing internally because at alchemist we never really we, we barely met the people before we invested in them before they joined alchemist i mean like i said we we had more of an awareness internationally but i would say our interview days were like 75 percent virtual so i never met them until they actually got in and then you know then as we moved to a fully virtual program some people have never met each other even during the program or after so it's this is just this is, was my world and yeah. so coming in into pure vc and learning like you guys wouldn't make an investment unless you actually shook hands with the person like and the whole team <laughs> i was like um but but that that has been the world um and so it was it's that was definitely an eye opener for me um coming into this role um i i do think that you know vc vc funds have had no other option but to be fully virtual and so they're getting very comfortable now but where does that how do they get comfortable usually if they are they don't know anyone connected to the founder um, you know, no one to vouch for them, like that, that's going to probably be a harder deal to cross over the finish line, um, or the due diligence is going to be a lot deeper. Um, but if they come in through like a warm lead or someone they know and trust, that's going to help you, you know, tenfold um, in terms of getting through the door, um, moving along the process. Um, What's so the best way to get an intro to you, Danielle? I'm sorry? What's the best way to get an intro to you? Oh, email. Um, email is, I, I mean, I don't have a lot of people because of our funds focus areas. Um, I, you know, I don't have a lot of people like cold emailing. Um, we need to find investments that any one of our LPs would want to work with. Um, and just for those out there, LPs include Foxconn, um, Northwestern Mutual, which is the largest life insurer, Advocate Aurora Health, which is the sixth largest healthcare provider, and um, Johnson Controls. And so, if you fall, if you think you can sell into any one of those four LPs, feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, but honestly, you know, a lot of the deals that I get are through my network. Um, people I talk to, um, knowing what you know, I'm focusing in, they'll recommend deals that I should take a look at. Um, and then I'm also very connected into all of the top kind of accelerators. So taking a look at all of the, the groups, I would say that, you know, we don't have the benefit of being a top tier brand name fund. So I am doing a lot more hunting than most, um, but uh, it's fun. It's fun. I get to, I get to learn about new things all the time. Best thing to do is just email me and uh, I'll tell you what Danielle's favorite wine is. <laughs> That's what, that's, that's the that's secret. That's the helpful. secret. That's what you need to know. So Lori, so Lori, Lori Lynn asks about how due diligence has changed in the, uh, you know, in the Zoom world. Uh, and both of you guys have, you know, both of you guys are participating in due diligence. So uh, how has that changed? Louis? Well, I'll take that first from a, from a legal perspective. Um, we're just using a lot more software tools to analyze uh, data. Mm -hmm crunch through it faster. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, Kira Systems, uh, which is a legal tech company that uh, helps analyze uh, data rooms. And uh, it's really helped me compete from a small boutique uh, against, you know, big giant law firms uh, where I used to sit, where I used to have, you know, endless amounts of troops. And now I, you know, I've got a small number of lawyers that I can count on. And now we have the software, which really increases speed and accuracy and efficiency. And it's, it's awesome. Um, again, the in-person, you know, it used to be that a lot of these diligence meetings were looking at people in the, in the deep depths of the whites of their eyes and getting a sense of them as people and, and seeing their body language as they presented slides and having interactive meetings and all of that is happening obviously uh, remotely. Um, I have not seen, well, I think during the summer and, and the early fall, there, there be, re began kind of socially distanced walks and out, outdoor, uh, outdoor fish tacos uh, on the sidewalk. Uh, you know, even with, with a lot of investors, that was just verboten. They didn't want to open the door to it at all. Um, right. They just couldn't do it. And, and, and so therefore it just became this, this Zoom thing and, and both in terms of intros and, and due diligence. And, and uh, I, I think that uh, it'll be interesting when the world reopens, whether we go back to the way it was before. I, I don't think so. I think yeah. uh, yeah. the investors I talk to, they love the fact that they can vet things through Zoom without having to travel or go somewhere, or have, you know, kind of a stiff meeting with, you know, 
whatever social pleasantries they can just really cut through a lot of that now i i think part of the art is is bringing back those things um those social pleasantries back into the virtual uh environment and, and uh helping build confidence um and, and inside companies it's helping build teamwork uh, I, i'm working with a, a one of my clients who has and I wish I remember the name of the software. Maybe somebody on the on the show knows. Uh, but but what they were telling me is that it, it's a software program that replicates the office environment, so everybody can see who's talking to who, as if they're you know in an, in an office, or so you could see through the glass panes who, who's who's meeting in conference room three. Um, I think that's pretty cool, um, and it helps people you know stay plugged in and know what's going on. And and so the more that we can recreate those those experiences, I think the better, do, the more quality due diligence will happen. Now, I get worried about fraud. Um, you know, how, is it easier to sneak things by people when everything is remote? And so I am spending a lot more time on due diligence doing um, almost, I, I, won't, I won't say detective work. So I'm doing more like litigation searches, lean searches, um, background checks on people. I really recommend basic background checks uh, anytime mm -hmm. you're investing. And frankly, if, if you're about to form a company with another co-founder who you don't really know that well, geez, do a background check. Find out if they've yeah. been bankrupt three times or have been yeah. to jail. Um, right. you know, not that that's a qualifier, but you know, you, you gotta you gotta do this basic stuff that you know, you, you, you might not think of doing in, in the in, in regular times. All right, I'm gonna get off my soapbox about due diligence. No, that's a great, it's a great tip. Uh, I love the idea of doing a background check, check on your co-founders. <laughs> like that's actually a really good tip. Well, I mean, it's going to come up anyways as part of the due diligence process. Yeah. Like as a standard, right. most of them ask the, co the founders to do background checks anyway. So, um, you know, it's probably better that you bring it up to us instead of we bringing it up to you. <laughs> like, you know, right. if we're calling you out sure. and saying, have you been to jail? Like, um, probably right. should have known that before we got, we went down this path, right? Um, so that's that's a quick way of losing faith, in, you know, with your VCs if you can't be honest with them from the get-go. Uh, so yeah, um, you know, and, and not to say that it's a bad thing, things happen, it's just, you gotta, you gotta kind of bring those things to light and don't kind of sweep them under the rug because we will find out and it's gonna look a lot worse. Um, you know, there, there have been horror stories in VC where sometimes they let some diligence items slide and then they go to find out that, oh, the CEO is actually embezzling or like, you know, funding, funding right. their side project and stuff. And so, you know, it, it does happen. Um, and after you've spent like millions of dollars in a round, um, you know, it, it, you can get away with it. Uh, you know, the, the CEOs will, or someone on the team will have to be kicked out or moved around, right? Like, but you don't want that kind of negative bad press um, surrounding your company. Um, we Google everything now, um, honestly. And, and so, you know, uh, just know that if it is findable online, we probably will find it or we will know someone who will be able to right. tell us what's up. <laughs> so um, yeah, just, just come clean up front. Um, you know, if there's things, things that are obvious um, on Google, uh, it's probably best for you to bring it up to us, let us know and give us your explanation. So nothing comes as a surprise. Um, Excellent point. Excellent yeah. point. So, so a lot of the topics that we've been talking about so far this morning, um, you know, Zoom calls and, and, uh, 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 clusters of innovation all over the world and all the, and how do you do dil due diligence in a virtual world? So a lot of this kind of dovetails into what I think is one of the biggest trends for 2021 is just that we're entering a place agnostic world, right? That uh, place matters less uh, today than it, than it used to. And, you know, that was a trend that obviously was already going on. And then the pandemic, you know, just kind of took it to the next level. Uh, you know, we really are entering, I think, a place agnostic world, and that has all kinds of, of, of implications. Um, I was on a call the other day with, uh, with, with Penny Pritzker, who was uh, uh, Secretary of Commerce under Obama, and somebody on the call, we we're talking about the pandemic and stuff, um, and somebody on the call asked her, when do you think, when do you think we'll be back to normal? And Penny said, she said, you know, I, I think actually that's the wrong way to 
phrase the question because we're never going back to 2019. That's done and gone. Mm -hmm. um, so we're never, it's not a matter of when are we going back to normal? It's more, the question is more, when are we gonna enter steady state, the, the new normal, right? Um, and so I think this has a lot of implications and we've been talking you know, in the last five minutes or so about how increasingly pitches are gonna continue to be done via Zoom. Uh, due diligence is gonna continue to be done in ways different than what it was done uh, the way it was done before. Um, and um, in chat, we got a good question about uh, global events. Um, Anoop asked about, uh, some of you may know, uh, uh, there's a company out of London called Hopin that's a virtual events platform. Uh, they, you know, this is a company that is less than a year old and has raised $125 million at a $2.1 billion valuation. <laughs> and it's all because, you know, all of a sudden in the pandemic, it looks like virtual events are here to stay. Um, so, um, so Anoop asks in, you know, in chat about, you know, what do we think about virtual events? Do we think virtual events are here to stay? Um, you know, Danielle, if somebody brought you a virtual events uh, startup uh, deal, is that something that would look interesting to you right now? Um, you know, not, not to me as at, at the fund, um, I would say if it was at Alchemist, um, uh, we did actually invest in a virtual events, um, a company there. Um, and I'm blanking on the name, unfortunately, but they, you know, they came in right as the pandemic was starting. I do think that that might be the one thing that we haven't been able to fully replicate in this virtual world, right? this need for in-person community socialization, um, you can only get so much of that in a virtual capacity. I think work has, now that we're kind of over this like fear of, oh, do we really trust people to work remote? Now that we know that people can and be productive, if not even more productive, they're working more, you know, because we can, we, you don't have to go anywhere. Um, I think that has been solved kind of in a virtual way. I don't think that events have completely, you know, been been solvable in a virtual environment. I do think that we probably will go back to some sort of, um, you know, in person kind of capacity, so people can socialize and meet. And I think after this last year, I think we've been all really missing that. Um, so I think it's actually going to come back with a vengeance, but we'll we'll see. We'll see. I am so with you. It's coming back with a vengeance, Danny. <laughs> I, you can't get me to go to a virtual event. I love these little webinars where yeah. there's a topic or there's a person that I want to see, um, but I just can't uh, seem to bring myself to sit in front of a Zoom for eight hours as if I was at a conference, and yeah. I just can't do it. Yeah. it yeah. Like, yeah. And yeah. Maybe, all, maybe the software is perfectly good enough, and maybe it actually works and it replicates the whole experience, but, but there hasn't yet been that thing that will make me actually try it. I don't know how to explain it. So I have yeah. a friend, James Mawson, who runs the Global Corporate Venture Institute, a really, and he does awesome conferences around the world. And we work together. So I think last week was their, their, their flagpole event. Normally it's in Monterey and he did it virtually. And, and so, you know, I bought the ticket because I want to support it. And, you know, I'm, I'm afraid these conferences are going to disappear because they're going to go under. Um, so I want to support them. They, they serve a really important function of getting people together and, and fostering new ideas. So I, I bought the ticket and, and I did tune in to a bunch of the specific panels with people that I was interested in, but I, I couldn't seem to get myself to pretend that I was in the, the cocktail hour and, and mingle in the digital environment. I felt like I was, yeah. you know, yeah. it just, it, it just felt right. goofy. I didn't do it. Yeah. And it's also, right. it, it's, you're distracted too. I mean, if I have a conference playing on one side of my screen and then on the other, I've got my email and my Slack and all this other stuff, like my attention is really, you know, is really scattered, right. um, you know? And so am I giving you my full attention being, um, you know, yeah, uh, I, I'm not. It were, if I was in person, then yes, maybe I paid to be there, right? Like I've, I've got some skin in the game. I'm going to be there. I'm going to try to be as present as possible um, outside of just, you know, my phone. Um, but you're there to kind of make the most of it, um, you know? So otherwise, like once I know your name, I can find you on LinkedIn and then I can schedule one-on-one -on -one with you, right? So. <laughs> That's a really great point. Um, I think something interesting is happening with these virtual experiences where, 
people are not paying attention. So I was in a board meeting yesterday and, um, you know, people are taking their turns, doing their presentations and already in an in-person board meeting, it's hard to keep people focused. And usually, you know, I always tell my CEOs, you know, tell every, all your people at the table that put their phones away, turn them off and turn off their email and to please bring and pay attention. But in the, in the virtual world, it's like impossible. And so you have these calls where like decisions are get get made and people were on those calls and they didn't even hear them. They, didn't, they weren't paying attention. Decision was made right in front of them. And, and then people go off running and, and it's a problem. Um, I, I think that the, they need to invent a Zoom uh, decision was made button uh, <laughs> comes up on the right hand side yeah. so that people can see what happened because you know they're they're multitasking to your point, Danielle. All mm -hmm. right, I'm going to shut up. Back to you, Brett. <laughs> so, Louis, on the on the whole trend about uh, moving into a place agnostic world. Um, so, Taryn asks in chat about. Um, There's been a lot of publicity recently about companies moving out of Silicon Valley. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, take advantage, take advantage of taxes or time zones or uh, access to talent, um, uh, all those things that have become difficult in Silicon Valley um, in recent years. So, you know, it used to be that everybody wanted to incorporate in Delaware and do business in California, right? That, you know, 99% of the startups pitching on Sand Hill Road were incorporated in Delaware and planning to do business in California. <laughs> so to what extent are you, you know, in your law practice seeing either of those things changing? Um, that's a great question. Um, what I am seeing is still the Delaware C Corp, um, still the foreign qualification in California, but um, people are having a rent an office or uh, they asked me to use my office, which I don't allow for various reasons, not to be mean, but it, it just doesn't work. Um, and I am seeing them, you know, in all places all around the world. And and the other thing, Brett, I'll say is, is um, I sit in a lot of boardrooms and I hear, you know, venture backed uh, or venture capital uh, directors telling their, their companies, hey, you know, for these four new hires that are in your plan, why don't you make them somewhere else. Uh, and and I'm, yeah. I'm seeing the, the companies themselves saying, hey, you know, we're looking for a CMO and yet, you know, the, the number, the, the budget salary is lower than you would expect because we're going to look for this person in fill in the blank. And, you know, it's pretty much anywhere else in the world is cheaper to do business than here other than maybe New York and London. And, and, um, and so I think that's a, that's a major trend. And, and I would say before the pandemic, people were looking outside the United States. That was a major trend that, mm -hmm. that people were looking at, at Chile, for example, or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, Central America or, or um, yeah. you know, European companies, Morocco uh, or, or someplace like that. I'm seeing less of that. Um, for some reason, the, the whole cross-border nature of travel, somehow I think that's scaring people to, to do that. But um, I, I'm definitely seeing, you know, the decentralization of companies for sure. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of alternatives to, to Delaware, are you seeing more, uh, you know, Nevada or even Canada? No. Or is, Del or is Del Delaware still the place? It is still the place. Right. I mean, I think during the, the whole coin thing, we saw a lot of Wyoming and Puerto Rico, oh, right. and Estonia, right. Singapore. Estonia, uh, right. I think you know, if and when distributed ledgers come back <clears throat> as a thing, um, as Bitcoin has certainly come back with a vengeance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think we might we might see more of, of, of those other alternative jurisdictions, but Delaware is still uh, the place to go. Louis, as long as we're talking legal stuff, uh, Adele asks in chat about SPACs. No discussion of, no discussion of 2021 trends would be complete without talking about SPACs. What what shall, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> so for those so for those of you who may not know, so SPAC is a special purchase acquisition company corporation. A special purpose acquisition company, and it is essentially yeah. it was invented in the seventies to be a public alternative to private equity. So whereas private equity folks used to or still do raise a fund of let's say a hundred million dollars, and as soon as they return the fund. 
uh, return the capital, they get the first uh, 20% of, of returns. Uh, maybe there's a hurdle, whatever. Um, they're doing that in the public market. So um, the idea is to be able to do this in an IPO, you have to, you have to not have a plan. So you, it's called a blank check. So you're asking public investors to give yeah. you a blank check. And right. these people with, with very famous resumes are you know, lending their resumes to a company and saying, you know, we, we are the directors of this company. And, and then, so they go public, they collect their, their money and what they have issued to the public, uh, which is mostly hedge fund investors that buy this product are units. And the units are composed of one share of common stock and one warrant to buy one share of common stock at the IPO price. Yep. And then the sponsor has their 20% carry. So the problem with these vehicles is they have two years to find an acquisition and they have to spend at least 80% of the cash on that acquisition. So there's been this, this whole backlog of a, of a lack of public markets over the last, uh, frankly, 15 to 20 years, as we all know, not enough IPOs every year. And all of a sudden with a backlash or, or, or with, a, with gusto, the SPAC kind of reignited the IPO market as companies needed some kind of exit in, in the last year or, or not necessarily exit, they needed to be capitalized in a significant right. way. And venture firms aren't going to write those kinds of checks and take that kind of risk. And, so for, uh, so for, for, for anybody who don't, doesn't know, let me just kind of briefly explain this back concept, which is that instead of, and Louis, please jump in and tell me if I have this wrong. So instead of having an IPO, which is kind of the traditional way for a company to uh, get liquidity from the public markets, um, the SPAC idea, the special purpose acquisition company, is you form a shell company and you say this, the purpose of the shell company is to acquire this other company. And then you kind of have an IPO with the shell company. And then once it's got a bunch of money in it, then it buys the target company as opposed to the target company just having an IPO on itself. Louis, is that conceptually accurate? Yeah. You said that much more and simply than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I don't bill for the hour. <laughs> so, and for whatever reason, there's been a real pro proliferation of, of these, um, as Louis said, and, and, um, and some concern about them because they are essentially blank check entities where you're you're raising money in the public markets and giving uh, uh, giving the executives a blank check for them to go go do some acquisitions. So Mika Mika so Michaela asks an interesting question that uh, um, both of you for both of you to uh, weigh in on, which is um, as we enter this place agnostic world, um, you know, there's this question about um, you know should companies uh, you know you get Facebook and suddenly you work at Facebook and you're like hey I could do my job from anywhere. Um, so I'm going to leave my my six thousand dollar a month mortgage in East Palo Alto, uh, you know, and I'm going to move to Boulder where I have a decent standard of living, um, and I'll just work at Facebook remotely from Boulder. So you know, should Facebook then reduce their salary uh, because they've moved somewhere with a lower cost of living? Um, and also, as we're entering a new this new world with the vaccine and stuff, a lot of people don't want to come back. Should companies you know, like offer a bonus for you to, you know, start working in the office again. Have either of you seen uh, 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 clients in your case, Louis, or portfolio companies in your case, Danielle, who are kind of struggling with this issue of how to deal with compensation in, in the remote work world? Not yet, um, honestly, I would, I mean, I think it was still too new. I think people were a bit, where they were, they were in this transition and I don't want to say a full trans the exploratory phase, if you will, for, for last year. And they were taking advantage that if we don't have to work in the office, then I'm going to work somewhere else. Now, the long-term effects of that, I do think if you, you know, like anything, if you do choose to work in a, another state that has a lower cost of living, your compensation should be competitive, but it doesn't need to be at the same rate that you were probably getting to afford your you know, standard of living in, in Silicon Valley, right? Like it should still be, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it should still be high, right? For the area, but um, it probably won't be at the same. I'm not really sure about getting bonuses to come back into the office. Um, I think a lot of actually employers are debating whether they should keep their offices at all, right? Yeah. Um, and if they if they are, are they, are they downsizing? Which I hear a lot of companies are, right? They're downsizing. And so there are going to be people that do want to come to the office. You're not going to have to pay them. Like, like I said, we're all missing this kind of socialization. 
Um, and for your extroverted workers, they're definitely, you know, probably going to want to come back once they feel comfortable. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, why spend the money on, on people who are already productive? It doesn't kind of make sense to me from a business perspective. Louis? Um, well, I'm definitely seeing large tech companies reducing compensation for people that relocate and they're divvying up the United States and the world into regions and they're saying you are moved out of region one and now you're in region 13 and our, our comp level for a director in region 13 is X. So your new salary is X. Now, of course, um, how does a company know if you've you know, gone to region 13? Uh, you know, it relies on the employees telling them. And if, if it's just a temporary thing, are they? And so I'm seeing some of that in big tech. Now in startup land, you know, no impact. Uh, I, I don't think it's changing anything about what they pay and, and what they do. Um, and it's just tolerated uh, completely. As far as bonuses of coming back to work, I have not heard of it. Um, you know, I think I think maybe later in the year we'll we'll start hearing about what companies are doing to get people to come back because I think they, people will. I want my lawyers that I work with, uh, you know, to be down the hall or in in the cube or across the table. Um, and, and you know, how are we going to facilitate that um, at the same time as being more tolerant of people working remotely from anywhere forever? I don't know. Um, you know, the other thing is, how do we know if they've been vaccinated and whether they're safe? And is it is it okay to require people to be vaccinated? I'm getting a lot of those questions, mm -hmm. and and the answers are really complicated beyond the scope of of this webinar. Um, there are a lot of products coming out. Uh, Brett, um, that, that are helping employers navigate this and, and, you know, where it's a voluntary system, employees can, can log in and, you know, provided by the employer, they can log in and say when, when they got vaccinated, but you can't force people. And, and uh, obviously at some point when the office opens and if somebody hasn't given proof of their vaccination, you're, you're going to kind of wonder, Ooh, do I want that person in the office? Right, uh, right, right, right. Like public school where you have to prove vaccination in order to get into the office or on a plane or, yeah. or um, across a border. That, that's, that, I think, remains to be figured out. My, my wife and my uh, youngest daughter is in school at NYU right now. <clears throat> they get tested every single week. And your access card to get into the buildings on campus is automatically deactivated if you have not tested negative in the last week. Uh, and wow. you know, it's, and I think we will see more stuff like that as we move into the post the post pandemic world. Yeah, um, JCI just made uh, Johnson Controls just made an investment into a company that's that's trying to do this for their commercial buildings for you know coming back to work. So definitely think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that uh, from a commercial setting. But again, like how many people are going to be in the office and utilizing it? They're probably going to have to weigh the pros and cons there as to whether right. whether it makes business sense. Um, or just sure. not have an office at all. So There's last, so many last, last, go ahead. Sorry, Louis, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move on to the last question because we just have two minutes left. So last, so last question goes to Faye who asks about um, trends with regard to investment structure. So traditional venture capital was always just simply equity. Um, and then along came convertible notes, which became, you know, which kind of an innovation at the time, and, you know, kind of a way of doing early stage Financing, where we don't, we can defer the question of valuation, um, and then YC came along with safes, which were kind of an innovative alternative to convertible notes. <clears throat> and today, there's a bunch of really interesting financing mechanisms out there available. Some are revenue, revenue share, where the investor gets a share of revenue. Um, uh, some are uh, royalty based. Some are uh, um, uh, milestone based. So, um, you know, to what extent are either of you seeing, um, you know, innovations with regard to investment structures? Honestly, none on my part. Um, in the early stages, still very typical note safe price rounds. Um, yeah, not not very many innovations there, but um, you know, definitely down down the pipe uh, with SPACs and everything. That's kind of where the, the new innovation is, although it seems pretty commonplace at this point. Right, so you're seeing the standard three, which is equity, convertible notes, and safes. Yeah. Louis? 
Absolutely the same. Um, I, I would say one other um, uh, tool I've seen a lot of, of my companies using that are kind of getting closer to the end of their runway is they'll, instead of signing a, a one-year customer deal, they'll they'll front load three years of, of revenue and give a big discount on year three. So do a three-year deal ah. instead of a one-year yeah. deal and discount it. Right. And, and, you know, essentially you're betting that you'll somehow make that work in the second and the third year. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a novel idea to have your customers fund your business? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the way we did it back when America was great, Danielle. <laughs> well, All right, well, on that, on that note, um, uh, this has been great. Thank you, Danielle and, and, and Louis. Uh, I really enjoyed this. We've covered a lot of territory. Um, and to the rest, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's been a great discussion. And we'll send out a, uh, an email with kind of a recap and a, and a copy of the recording. Uh, please connect with um, with any of the three of us on LinkedIn um, mm -hmm. and tell us your own your own thoughts about uh, about trends and what you think is going on that's worth paying attention to. Thanks very much to everybody. Have a great day and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Brett.